I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, so joining us once again is Dr. Frank Wilderson, who, among many other things, is a, a full professor of drama and African American studies at the University of California, Irvine. And he is a prolific author and writer of, again, among other things, uh, Incognito, his memoir uh, about his time in the, uh, the anti apartheid struggle in South Africa, uh, and uh, Red, White, and Black, uh, and the discussion of U.S. cinema. And uh, uh, it's continuing and, and it's reflection of continuing antagonisms. Uh, and I will, again, go back and get that title again straight. Uh, anyway, the first book, I'm sorry, was Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid that came out on South End Press in 2008. And uh, Red, White and Black Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms, uh, which came out. Uh, what year did that come out? 2010. 2010. Uh, and, uh, um, and for those who are listening to this program or to our website, will know that uh, they can find, uh, our, our previous interviews with Dr. Wilderson at imixwhatilike.org. Uh, but again, uh, uh, Frank, welcome back to the program. Thank you for joining us and, and taking this time. Oh, always glad to be here, Jared. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as I said, you know, off air, one of the things I wanted to, to get to first uh, uh, is an outline of, of this argument that you and others have been extending and developing uh, on this 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 discussion of anti-blackness, the libidinal, the libidinal economy. Uh, and if we can, before we get to a discussion of of uh, this post Mandela moment, go back for a moment and discuss these two pieces as you've written about them previously in a, uh, an edited, an edited anthology called Biko lives. Um, because, you know, as I was, I went back and was looking at that, uh, uh, brother and has been on the program a couple of times and he's one of the co-editors of that book. And I went back and was looking at your piece. Uh, and you know, so you bring up this issue of anti-blackness and the libidinal economy, uh, so if we could let's start there and then we'll go back and talk a little bit about how you applied those concepts to your discussion of Biko. And then we'll update that for your discussion of a post Mandela moment of Azania, uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, OK, well, let's to, to to not to make it simplistic, but to try and put this in a framework that um, your super but perhaps uninitiated listeners might um, need Basically, you know, it, under under there's there are two lenses. Uh, actually, there are three lenses of interpretation, which I interrogated in Red, White, and Black: Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms. And what I, one lens was was the lens of of white feminism. The other was the lens of Marxism, and the third was the lens of uh, uh, indigenous or Native American indigenism. What I was trying to show is how these three uh, apparatuses of, or apparati, I don't know what is proper here, of interpretation, think about what is the essential meaning of suffering, and then what the essential meaning of suffering implies about what would it mean to be free. And I was trying to say that black people are not necessarily outside of these paradigms and apparatuses of, of, of interpretation, but that the way in which these paradigmatic analyses understand structural violence is extremely limiting and uh, cannot explain the soup, the kind of ocean of violence that inhabits black lives. Because in all these situations, whether it's um, the way the cosmology and the, the grammar of suffering that comes out of indigenism, uh, from people like Vine Deloria or Ward Churchill and that, that elaborated the American Indian movement, or whether it's uh, radical feminism, uh, people like, you know, Judy Chicago, um, Judith Butler, or Katja Silverman, or whether it's radical Marxism, uh, Antonio Negre, uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci, and uh, Karl Marx, that all these people understand structural violence, which is the, the, the violence of the apparatus that, that, that controls people, they understand it as being contingent, which is to say that they understand violence to happen to their essential revolutionary subject, 
when that subject violates or transgresses the rules of a paradigm. I want to move to the next point. Is that is that pretty clear at that point, Jerry? Yes, yeah, so far, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. So the worker receives violence when he or she refuses the, the constraints of the wage relations, goes on strike, robs a bank, um, does, every, does anything to, um, to get out of the wage relation. Um, the Native American receives genocide and violence when he or she transgresses um, the paradigm of, of land appropriation. Uh, and in the libidinal economy, uh, the woman receives violence, and these white feminists think women as a kind of non-racial category, when she transgresses the patriarchal order. I never said in the book that those things aren't true and that black people don't suffer that violence inside those patterns also. What I said is that that type of understanding of violence, I always use the word violence, I tell my students, go back to structural violence when you're having trouble thinking about the difference the difference between blacks and all others go back to structural violence. The thing about it is that the black does not, violence does not accrue to the black because of a transgression. And this is the hardest thing for us to understand, and when we do understand it, it's the, it's the most difficult thing to kind of inhabit thinking-wise, emotionally, because it has all sorts of implications. If one, like you and I, have black children. How do you uh, talk to a black child about violence and about sanctuary when you know that there is no sanctuary? So to, to sum up this one point, all these paradigms of subjectivity and suffering, patriarchal from white feminism, Marxism, indigenism, that I studied in the, first, in the second book, uh, would say that... You, the, the, the prehistory of a paradigm, which is to say the, 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 his, the history that builds to create the Western Hemisphere, if you're an indigenous person, or the prehistory of a paradigm in Marxism, the history that, that builds to, cre- to, to move from feudalism to communism, if you're, if you're a Marxist, that, that, that prehistory is so violent, so genocidal, that it looks like gratuitous violence. The, the thing is that once those paradigms are in place, once we've got capitalism all over the globe, and once uh, the, the Indian has been properly, in quotation marks, subjugated, and South, Central, and North America belong to this new thing called the New World, then the violence changes for these people. The violence becomes what is known as contingent, and the violence kicks in this, this massive violence that it took to make these New World orders. It kicks in when these subjects refuse their place. We can't think of black people like that because the violence of blackness has this prehistory, which is um, S.E. S. Anderson in his documentary comic book, The Black Holocaust, uh, points out as being perhaps 625 when the Arabs started enslaving uh, Africans. It has a prehistory building up, right, to the 1400s, and then we get basically solidified where Africa becomes the place to go get slaves for everyone in the world. But, but the prehistory, the, the, the ocean of violence that created is a prehistory of, of blackness and slaveness never goes away. Never goes away. And what that means is that it changes, you know. In other words, lynching comes into being in the in the eighteen uh, seventies and, and goes on strong till nineteen sixty eight. And and black civil rights and black power, you know, push against this paradigm. But it, but that, sorry, push against that that particular kind of performance of violence. But it never goes away. It shifts, right? It just kind of fractures itself through the prism and shifts over to another. Um, technology and locale, like the police and the prison industrial complex. So we cannot say that violence accrues to black bodies because of a rational, coherent, conceptually solid transgression that black people make. It's absolutely necessary for all people in the world and for all uh, paradigmatic situations of the world to uh, deploy and keep redeploying 
um, gratuitous violence against black bodies because violence against black people gives everyone else psychic stability, breathing room. I know what I am because I am not that thing over there, blackness. That's it in a kind of short nutshell, but we can go from there. No, I mean, and again, that's why, you know, as I, 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 I love the quote, uh, more or the paraphrases I do it from, from James Baldwin, that whole thing where he, he once said that when a white man calls me nigger, I don't get mad at him. I just ask him why he needs me to be one, because if I'm not the nigger, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I'm not, you know, if I'm not the nigger you say I am, then you're not the white man you say you are. And then everything collapses. You know, it's like, it, it, you know. Um, but I was, I was, well, but, but Jared, Jared yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's such a good point that you made because it's a point that Lewis Gordon keeps making. It's, it's not that, that black people, you know, are generally dishonored. It's, but it's that the, the, the libidinal economy of everybody else who says we are has, as Lewis Gordon says, has this little, uh, connection to the violence that makes their fantasy world true in quotation marks. So it's, it's the fantasy of our abjection, but the deal is that as, as Lewis Gordon, Lewis Gordon um, uh, and uh, David Marriott in California have pointed out, black fantasies have no objective value because black fantasies uh, are not adjacent or connected or, or, or harnessing a kind of violence to make our fantasies true. Hmm. Mm. Uh, again, everybody, we're listening to a, we're, we're we're talking with a Dr. Frank Wilderson here, and I mix what I like. Uh, you know, I want as you applied this to the situation you found yourself in uh, that you describe in your essay in in the Biko Lives anthology. Uh, and, and I know we don't have time to really get into what you what the meeting was about, and I honestly don't remember off the top of my head, but. But you were talking about a meeting that you you were in, uh, uh, an overwhelmingly black South African meeting. I think you said there were a couple of whites, a couple of so-called coloreds and Indians, I think, were involved. But 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 overwhelmingly, it was a black South African gathering. And you were ad- addressing yourselves to some moderate leadership who were concerned about the the courses of action that were being discussed uh, um, uh, in that meeting and they came back and basically said if you all do what you all are planning to do uh, the, the government's just going to come in and start shooting everybody and everybody's going to get killed and you said that the, the response from the crowd to the shock and, and dismay of the, of the, of the announcer was, was a welcome cheer uh, uh, that, that, and you said that the threat of death and the threat of the bullets that were being promised um, were, as you described, gifts of recognition. Uh, and I thought that was profound because I think that this happens a lot in liberation struggles, uh, maybe not described in this way, but could you talk a little bit about how this issue of, of, of sort of, a, of, of blackness as non-being relates to how the crowd reacted, as you described, looking at the bullets that were coming as gifts of recognition. Yes, I, I think that uh, there, was a, there was a sense always in South Africa that the way in which we were thinking about the problem, which is a problem of economic exploitation, was only part of the, part of the puzzle, that there was something else happening in which um, black people in South Africa who were grossly exploited economically and the, you know, their land has been taken and their, their wages. Um, and, but there's another form of, of oppression, which is that the, just like black people in the, in the, in the new world, their presence as living, breathing cultural subjects was not recognized. In other words, I, if I'm a black South African, I see myself as of a certain cosmology of, of, of gods and deities and, and in the spirit world and ancestors and um, land that I have a certain type of, of spiritual and emotional relationship to, and a language that I speak, and all sorts of anthropological attributes uh, like the way I... I make my houses, my address, uh, which make for the so-called vibrant immigrant society in places like the, like, the, like the U.S. But what was happening in South Africa is that the word 
Kaffir, like the word nigger here, stood in for what describe all blacks, regardless of their you know, cultural accoutrement. So they were experiencing a kind of, of what Fanon calls niggerization. I think it was harder for, for South Africans in general, in particular in Africans in, in, in general, to, to, to deal with this because they feel that their language and their culture has not been robbed from them like blacks in the Western Hemisphere. And so they have an intense identity of themselves as cultural beings. And the world only sees black. So this thing about you're going to be shot um, should you uh, take your peaceful demonstration, which would be marching inside of what's called South Africa, and turn it left and bust through the fences of a, of a homeland, uh, to, so that because our point was to prove that there are, the homelands are illegal and we don't recognize them. And, and Ronnie Castro, who was a white communist South African head of one of the leaders of Mkonto Wasizwe, the, the guerrilla wing, he's now a, a major person in the intelligence um, agency in South Africa. When he says, he's speaking rationally, look, if you do this, you're going to be shot. And what he's not able to actually understand is that the, the, the depth of black suffering has a rational component, which is loss of wages, loss of land, et cetera. But it, has, it also has um, another component. I don't want to call it irrational, but it's, a, it's an unconscious component, which is that my subjectivity has been not just denied, but the, because that would be like a Vietnamese person, you know, denying their subjectivity through colonialism. My subjectivity has never been recognized since the Arabs and then the, the whites created this, this cauldron where they come to get slaves. So if you shoot at me, it's a sense there was a kind of transposition in our collective minds that that would be a recognition of us as being living, breathing, human presences to be reckoned with. And uh, it's recognition, and the other word is incorporation. Blackness cannot be recognized, nor can it be incorporated into um, the rules and structures of civil society, precisely because civil society defines itself at the very bottom, most fundamentally le fundamental level as being not black. So once blackness is recognized in any structure of civil society, then that structure is, is imbued with a kind of existential crisis, um, whether it's someone marrying my white daughter or someone becoming my black president, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not down with, with, with Obama, but damn, he's receiving so much anti-blackness that I feel bad for the brother, you know? So it was the bullets. So what, what Castles couldn't understand is that as a communist, he said, he thinks people need land and bread and, and, and to, to own their own wages and not have their wages become part of profit. Yes, that's true. But as an Afro-pessimist, I understand that what black people also need is the recognition of existence and that we present such a threat to the world because, we're, because the world over the past however many thousand years has begun to define itself in contradistinction to our recognition. That was that moment that, that the communists could not quite grasp. Something, other was ha something else was happening from inside of blackness, and uh, they thought it was just black people like crazy want to be killed. <laughs> right, right. And again, we're talking with Dr. Frank Wilderson here at I Mix What I Like. Uh, uh, and as I should have said at the top, again, I, I sometimes forget that, that not everybody has heard all of our previous conversations. But uh, part of what has drawn uh, 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 our collective uh, to you and to, to, to your extended um, comrades is is. Uh, your 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 book Incognito, uh, a memoir of exile and apartheid, where you recount your time as not only a, a, a part of the ANC struggle, but but a part of the Nkuntu Oweisi way armed struggle guerrilla wing of that movement, uh, and that that was of particular interest to us and remains particularly interesting to us, uh, you know, um, as you continue uh, on and doing the work that you're doing. Um, and we'll ask again that people can reflect back and we'll link to it again when we put this up uh, uh, to those previous interviews and people can, can double back and, and, and check out some of the video there too uh, at imixwhatilike.org. Um, 
you know, so in the in a few, uh, several weeks now at least have passed since uh, uh, the death of Nelson Mandela. Uh, a lot of obviously has been said about that, uh, uh, continues to be said in the tra- transition into a now post Mandela moment or post Nelson Mandela moment in South Africa. Uh, how should we interpret? You know, we again as as we were 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 you know uh, drawn to. Uh, initially, uh, Mandela was was quoted as saying that you, uh, Frank Wilderson, had become one of the greatest threats to a post-apartheid national security of South Africa. Um, so, and we've we've chronicled at least some of of, of the critique and criticisms that that you and others and, and we have had of. of of the ANC and of some of Mandela's decisions and so on. And I know that that's difficult, particularly in this moment, but how do you think, given what you've just said and some of what we've already just talked about today, how do you suggest that people interpret this moment going forward, uh, this post Mandela moment? Uh, um, uh, how do you, yeah. How do you, how do you see it best to interpret it and what, what we should, you know, and then, you know, do uh, moving. Ahead. Yeah. That's a very good question, and it's also a very difficult one. Um, so I'll start at the end. You know, what I would like people to do, including myself, is to think about how um, corrupt and inept and, um, and, and just unsatisfactory the, the ANC regime is uh, right now to think that at one level, I mean, it's just it's just a, a kind of a useless organization. But to also, while you're thinking that, not get into this uh, black demonization of black African leadership that goes there and stays there, the way that most people do in in the news. I mean, you have to think of the the black leaders in South Africa, from Jacob Zuma and before him, Thabo Mbeke and Nelson Mandela, as, uh, you know, making all the wrong decisions and as being kind of stooges and puppets for uh, uh, anti-blackness and, gl- and global capitalism, while at the same time understanding that those people are victims of those dynamics also, and that uh their actions, their performance is, is not the ultimate problem, even though they have to be dealt with and dealt with decisively. I mean, the ultimate problem, of course, is uh, in the, the white uh, imperial machine that right now has uh, a figurehead Negro at the head of it in the United States of America. So if, uh, that, that would be one thing, not to be caught in the trap of, of demonizing black leadership without having a, a larger understanding of the forces that are, are that are making this uh, betrayal of what we tried to bring about um, happen. And I'd like you to maybe direct me a little bit more in the direction you want to go, because I, could, I, could, I feel myself kind of spinning, no, not no, knowing exactly what... No, I appreciate that. I, I, I mean, you know... I, I, well, sort of as you said, I mean, we look at some of the, the, the lack of change in South Africa... Uh, that has occurred, and we look at uh, uh, again something that that is obviously more familiar to to me and, and several of us here in this country. But this the the discrepancy between the uh, uh, the language of post something of progress of improvement, uh, and certainly that was part of the narrative in describing uh, uh, Mandela's career, particularly in the Western press. I mean, a lot of discussion about his willingness to reconcile and forgive. Uh, a, a, a complete, especially those familiar with the history that you have helped uh, uh, unearth, um, or just the history of the struggle in general. I mean, that is a complete uh, cleansing uh, of of Mandela's history and the history of that struggle. Um, and you know, and, and then, and I guess I'm just trying to find ways of of not so to 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 reconcile those discrepancies, but also to find ways of of reminding people because even in the progressive media, there's been uh, uh, I, what I found to be um, I don't know maybe a marginal improvement in, in comparison to the so-called mainstream Western press in the in the discussion, but a lot that that there too 
is either afraid, uh, unwilling, or unaware of some of this other history of Mandela's involvement in this struggle, his, what his role was, what his role was in the in the post-apartheid moment. Um, so I, I really I'm, I'm 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 rambling myself, but but uh, you know, uh, 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 really I'm just trying to to find ways of of, of saying how can we be critical of. Uh, of of maybe or or the way I've tried to approach it at least is to be critical of the the structures that in, encourage certain patterns of behavior. So uh, yes. instead of just saying Mandela, you know, by himself sold out yes. or just you know whatever. I mean, there are structures here: yeah. long term imprisonment. There's the there's there's the, the 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 isolation. There's the 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 you know the time passing, the assassinations, the death, the the. I mean, there's all this that goes into to what decisions that an individual would make. And I've obviously never been confronted with anything like this. But at the same time, we see it. We hear from people themselves. I mean, Brother Ndile and the economic freedom fighters and, and, and other communities and other people in struggle in South Africa remind us all the time how little has changed and how, how past leadership has failed, whether it was, you know, because they were selling out or they just gave their best effort and didn't succeed. But while everybody's getting a lot of credit, as has happens in this country, for some sort of progress that has never occurred, we can't seem to have any real conversations about what went into these struggles that that what went yeah. in, you know and what what was lost you know so that's why we always yeah. ask you about the time in the the armed wing or or about what happened to the socialist uh, or wing of the struggle obviously what happens to Chris Hani and how does Steve yeah. Biko get re, you know erased from all this and then of course Winnie Mandela seems to also be uh, as big yeah. as she is and alive as she still is, she's removed yeah. from all the conversation. I mean, it's it's anyway. So uh, you know, I'm well, really, think, I'm not I'm not right, much so. helping you there, but 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 that's yeah. No, you are, you are, you are. Because what ha- I mean, I think the the thing the black people in the ANC, the black leadership, did some things that were not um, that were pretty reprehensible. I mean, one was the the way in which the ANC uh, that um, sometimes violently on the black consciousness movement and the you know so there was a lot of internecine uh violence that happened in the the 70s and the and the 80s and um and so the anc in, in striving for hegemony using uh progressive money from sweden and communist money and arms from the from the soviet union bloc uh worked to suppress and to purge all other forms of 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 radical organization. So there was a lot of internecine struggle and fighting between PAC and ANC. And because the ANC was, was more heavily financed and because it had a lot of white people, it, it won that. Uh, it absorbed a lot of the black consciousness people, thousands of them, in, after 76 uh, into its ranks, people swimming across the Limpopo River. The, most of these people, I'd say 90% of them, were you know, under the age of 25. And they're they're fleeing, you know, the Children's Revolution era, and they get to ANC camps, and they, their infusion radicalizes the ANC. But you know, the umbrella doctrine is uh, Soviet communism or uh, Western social democracy. Those are the, those are basically the two umbrellas, the only two umbrellas that you can have in the ANC. And so they've got to kind of get with the program even though their presence radicalizes the ANC and, and, and uh, really infuses the ranks of MK, Mkwonto Wasiswe, with thousands of more guerrillas and they can start the, the violent war again. Uh, when we come to the 1990s, Mandela gets out of prison and he... This is a little tricky because he doesn't... Mandelaism does a lot. The, 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 the old man himself might not do so much, but he certain san- certainly sanctions a kind of spirit of reconciliation over a spirit of revolutionary victory. So he's certainly for the former and not the latter. And a lot of people seep into the ANC, and many of them are American consultants. And so you've got, so he's surrounded with a certain type of person, U.S economic and political consultants, um, the moderates who are black and African uh, from the European and American capitals come back, and they begin to set up this thing called the AANC, which is now unbanned. And so by, by facilitating, I won't say he does everything himself, but by, by facilitating the marginalization 
of black conscious people facilitating the marginalization of black communists and by opening the floodgates for black moderates and for uh, white progressive NGO consultants, he, he then facilitates the creation of this ANC that, that, that is not a place where I want to be. When That's step one. Step two is he, he gives the portfolios for economic transport, transformation over to the moderates. So Pablo and Becky and Trevor Manuel head up the negotiations about the new economy. And the radicals and people to the left get the portfolios for political transformation. This is during the negotiation era. Chris Hani then is assassinated, and, and Mandela and five others certainly, uh, Mandela and or five others certainly had a hand in that assassination with key logistical information to the hitman. And then the Great Purge begins, where 100,000 so-called ultra-leftists are purged from the rolls, which is uh, the rolls are 350,000 card-carrying members. Mind you, 350,000 card-carrying members, uh, even though something uh, approaching, I don't know, 20 to 30 million people support the ANC. So he, pur- he purges, and in this purge, Winnie is purged, and she represents a very strong radical wing. By that time, we're now in 1990, end of 93, and the deal is done. The ANC is, is, is just a kind of United States Democratic Party get out the vote organization, and it's ready to be part of the neoliberal agenda. You know, again, uh, well, I mean, even, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to hear, as I have in the past, uh, uh, some sort of pushback or some sort of uh, uh, criticism of, about this point that you're making about Mandela's, you know, knowledge of or involvement in or awareness of Hani's assassination. Um, well, let me, let me be very specific of what I said. Yeah. I, I said that there are five people who knew that on the ninth the night of August, sorry, April 10th, 1993, Chris Hani was going to uh, give his bodyguards the night off because the next day was Easter. He is one of those five. Mm -hmm. And I say that that the assassination attempts that the Conservative Party had tried to make in the past had failed because they couldn't figure out the sleep movements because he slept different places. They couldn't figure out the bodyguard movements. And he, the bodyguards didn't know that they were going to be released. He told them on his front lawn, go home, tomorrow's Easter, be with your families. And they were kind of freaked out about that. Within 15 minutes of him telling them to hat up, the Polish hitman drove up to the front lawn and shot him in the driveway. That's key information that, that was only available to about these, these five people. And every time someone has tried to come forward to talk about who one of them or all of them might have been, something has happened to that person. So that's what I said. I didn't say Mandela made the phone call and helped the hit, but I didn't say, I said that he was in the, in the, the group of five that one or all of them did that thing that got that information over there. It doesn't really matter if he is the one that made that phone call because he benefited tremendously from it. Well, that was and that was going to be my follow up to that, that that, you know, aside from the fact that, you know, so so I think what you just said is extremely important. But uh, moving away from the, the fact that, or working around the fact that we don't know the specifics, we don't have the quote unquote smoking gun evidence as to who did what we can talk a little bit about what was the value to to the post apartheid ANC regime of Hani's assassination or removal in one way or another from the, p- the political scene. One question that I have is that because in the in the way his assassination is is, is recounted, even even recently, um, they talk about the two things stuck struck out stick out to me in the in the coverage of, of Hani's assassination. One, they the 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 news and the, the reports make mention of the fact that he was at the time where he was assassinated was in uh, a, a more middle class racially mixed suburb, which yes. I, which I thought was interesting and you know and I, I would want your comment as to why that point would not have to be made. Um, and and the other is is that Hani had already agreed publicly to support 
in uh, 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 peaceful negotiations and support of Mandela's ANC. So. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you why I'm laughing. At right. So, so I mean, those two things I thought always stick out to me as to to the the coverage because then, of course, I, as I take it at least, it's meant to convey this idea that that we were in a new moment, uh, that the assassination of Hani could not be seen as having anything to do with protecting the new leadership uh, or easing the transition. That this was sort of again, as we often hear in this country, sort of a lone nut. Uh, disassociated from any sort of political apparatus, uh, uh, and so on oh and so goodness. on and so on. So, so, oh my goodness. yeah. Could, could you just tell us a little bit uh, again? What? Why was Hani's assassination necessary politically? Okay. Well, yes, indeed. Well, uh, well, where to begin? Was you? You just cut me off when I get too long. But I'm going to try <laughs> to make this very succinct here. Okay. Uh, Chris Hani was the head of of the arm wing in Punta Lucia's way. Uh, he was also the head of the Communist Party. The Communist Party had 50,000 card-carrying members. Each of them were members were in that ANC, in the ANC, and they were the driving force of, of armed struggle. I was not a member of the Communist Party, even though I was in uh, MK, and the people that I was there with, uh, some of them were not in the Communist Party also, but most of them were. Uh, for me, the Communist Party was too much in fee to the Soviet Union, but that's another story. The point is that Hani was writing articles and making speeches um, that were saying that, look, I'm going to go along with this until through the first presidency of Nelson Mandela. And under the first presidency and through it and after it, I will emerge with a new independent party. It will be to the left of the Communist Party, so he's going to leave the, the South, African, South African Communist Party at some point, leave the ANC, and um, create this thing that would be more true to uh, the, the vision of, of, of total communism that the, the people on the ground uh, wanted. That was a big threat to the ANC leadership, that, that after the fall of the Soviet Union had already decided that you know, they were moving towards social democracy and not communism. The second thing was that the ANC was faced with a crisis that, that people, that's the ones you've just spoken about, Jared, who say this was a peaceful time. The ANC knew something different. If you take the period from 1948 to 1994, the, the big bulk period of, of apartheid, even though anti-blackness had been going on for 300 years, but 48 to 94, saw the, the murder of 1.5 million black people in the frontline states from Mozambique to, to um, Angola. But, and it saw the murder of 21,000 black people inside the country. Now, what people don't really get is that um, 14,000 of that 21,000, which is say two-thirds of that genocide number, died in the period that I arrived in South Africa, from 1989 to 1994. That means most black people in country were murdered in political deaths in the period that the Western world talks about as being the peaceful transformation. There are massacres happening all the time. And, and when the clerk in, in August of 1989 got rid of P.W. Bota through a kind of internal coup uh, in the in the in the, in the uh, ministers amongst the ministers and and through both his failing health, he got smart. He said, "We're not killing all these black people with whites anymore." He transported the next year, 1990, 100,000 in Kata Zulus from KwaZulu Natal on the east into Johannesburg, the big political center, to start killing black politicals as proxy. I mean, he flew them in in helicopters he, until they had saturated the townships, living single men in single men hostels, and just started burning out the residential homes and, and chopping up people. And they would move back and forth from these massacres, being transported by white police vehicles, or sometimes with uh, military helicopters. But he was able to call that black-on-black -black violence. So this time period of 14,000 of the 21,000 dying is is in the West, it's not even looked at because it's just looked at as the peaceful transition. On the ground in South Africa, the, 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 broad, the, the, the white media just transposed that as black-on-black -black violence. And the ANC was being called upon by people in the squatter camps and in the townships to react aggressively 
through our structures of, 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 of armed insurgents. Mandela was absolutely refusing to do that, okay? In, Hani was, was um, mounting a kind of subterranean program of retaliation and protection, but it was in contradistinction and it contravened Mandela's general mandate. So there was internal tension around this point, which is called the most violent point, which the world calls the most peaceful point. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and the black middle class is like saying to the black uh, uh, unskilled workers and the squatters, you know, just chill out, chill out, chill out, chill out until we get political power. And the unskilled workers and many of the skilled workers, miners, for example, and the, uh, and the lumpens are saying, no, go for the total revolution. And Hani has to make a public statement about being for the negotiated period precisely because he's not ready to jump ship from the ANC at that particular moment. Psychically, he, he, many of us were not ready. And because um, Mandela had created the end of the armed struggle, called the end of the armed struggle and reconciliation as the general rubric as opposed to revolution, without consulting Hani. He learned about it in the press. He read it in the newspapers. Okay? Mm, mm. <laughs> so then he had a choice. Okay, Do I go up against the old man publicly or just, or just, just get with the program and tell people like my unit, you know, uh, when you give over the guns from the secret uh, caches uh, to this, this de demobilization project that de Klerk and uh, Mandela said, uh, keep uh, one AK hidden and give them two. You know, so there's all this tension going on, and um, and it's really for what is going to be the new dispensation and who is going to be on top. Mandela had 1,995 delegate votes to the National Executive Committee of our party. He had 1,995 votes out of 2,000 votes. Hani had 2,000 out of 2,000. That tells you something about... Um, you know, Winnie Mandela was, she was, she, there were 100 people, she had something like 1,000 votes. So, so she was a, quite as, she was, she was half as popular um, as Mandela, but most women voted for her. And so you get rid of Hani, and you get rid of this kind of uh, galvanizing persona for black anger. Then you get rid of Winnie, and you get rid of another galvanizing persona for black anger and for, um, the uh, empowerment of women inside of the party, and now you're ready to go for this uh, patriarchal black Negro sellout agenda that happened. And just very quickly, because you've already said so much that is never in these these you know the the retellings of of, of Hani's assassination. But that that point that I keep seeing that 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 he was in this racially mixed suburb when he was killed. Ah. Uh, it, <laughs> I mean, again, it's meant of obviously to convey this this improved condition that meant you know his line of reasoning was less was less important or valuable at that moment, at least as I, I you know. But but uh, um, do you understand what I'm saying? So I mean, I, I, because the reports that I've seen and the, the the particularly the the news the video news footage uh, that I've seen online always make this point. They that they, they, they that it seems like an obvious attempt to make this point. That again, as I'm reading it, that that Hani's argument, uh, and and I do honestly put it in the way that 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 many in this country have been been mislabeled. You know, the the idea that Malcolm X's argument or Kwame Ture's argument was no longer necessary because of so much of the progress that had been made. Um, ah. You know, and so here's Hani being killed in in this racially mixed middle class. Suburb. It, it. I don't know. I mean, it just sounds. It just. It just sounds to me again like a. a, a, a like I, I don't know how else to better say it. But this attempt to to cast his politics as as anachronistic at the point of his assassination and 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 thereby separating it from again any political apparatus or or political move to remove him. Uh, yes. Yes. That's a very good point. And uh, what what the clerk understood. So, he, De Klerk and others helped bring about the, the dynamic that you're talking about so that there can be pushback against, uh, against a, a communist um, understanding of the world and, a, and, and or an Afro-pessimist understanding of the world. And what he did is he said, look, these things that are, that are kind of 
uh, part of apartheid laws and regulation that are really manifest um, cultural behavior. We we really, if we're going to survive as as in, in white domination, we can afford to get rid of some of these things. So let's get rid of the mixed marriages act. You know, the people if they want to marry, let them marry. Mm. Let's get rid of the group areas act. If they got the money to move in. You know, let them, let them move in, because the world is focused on uh, cultural racism. And if we can throw the world, you know, the Western world, the progressive Western world, if we can throw them a bone or two, right. then we can take the spotlight off of economic racism. And this is why, again, and, and as we take this on, on the day to commemorate Dr. King's uh, birthday, uh, this was something that he would come to note as well, right? That the, the lunch counter that was now desegregated was charging twice for the hamburger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, I mean, Hollywood learned this in the, at the end of the 1967 to like 77. So black people go to the movies right. and Hollywood's going bankrupt. So let's make some black exploitation films, right. you know? Damn. Stop. <laughs> You know, they had kowtowed the movie, Ivan Dixon did nothing but a man. In, uh, in 1966, he played the, the lead character in that. And um, they couldn't get that shown in the South because the poster for it show, uh, was a close-up of a black man and, and, um, and uh, oh, the singer, I, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. She's so famous. I'm going to look her up while we're there. Uh, well, Ivan Dixon and, and um, uh, this very famous jazz singer, who was the, the star um, uh, say, uh, kissing, or mm. their faces close together, and and the people in the South were saying, you, "We just can't have that right. on a on a movie bill, billboard." And so Hollywood was making all these, things. and they said, "Well, forget these people, you know, because what we what we need is the essential white domination, not uh, to kowtow to the, the the far right." And so, by the time Chris Hani gets back into the country, uh. You can move into a, a certain white neighborhoods if you've got the money, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. It means nothing at all. And he's not in, in Boxburg, because I went there for the for the funeral, and it was that was some six hundred and ninety thousand black unemployed people uh, at that funeral, and and we just tore it up. Me, me, I was employed, but I was right with them. You know? <laughs> Burning cars and burning buses. <laughs> Which, by the way, I mean, I mean, but by the way, now that you mention it, I mean that was very different than the ceremony for Mandela that we saw on TV with, with a half oh, yeah. empty, you know, a half empty stadium, uh, <laughs> ANC leaders being booed. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it, it almost it, it seemed to be quite clear, like we don't want that many black people to actually show up. Uh, no, 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 because they no, might no. actually go off script and and uh, anyway, I'm sorry, but but yeah. So you were saying about about Hani's well, service. well, Boxburg. If you go to Boxburg uh, and you look at uh, where compare Boxburg, where Hani's house was, and you, com- and you compare it to um, the other places where where the uh, ANC leadership lived in the north of uh, northern suburbs of, of Johannesburg. Um, you know, Boxburg ain't nothing to to shake a stick at. It's you know, it's like. Queens or something with decent, you know, uh, lower middle class homes, but it's not like he was living in the lap of of, of luxury. Right. That's number one. But number two is that look, all these a hundred people, a hundred NEC National National Executive Committee people are now back in the country. It's 1992, 93, and you can tell what civil society thinks by the way they walk around. So you got Tabo and Becky, right, near the top of the NEC, walking around, driving his bands uh, without bodyguards. Mm. You got Chris Hani walking around with six people surrounding him and in a, in a combi van full of, 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 of bodyguards. And he, he, wasn't, he wasn't sleeping at that box perk home regularly. Okay, that's what people don't understand. So if it was so decent and so safe and things had changed, you know, why couldn't he go to the crib every night without bodyguards right. in the way that someone like Pablo and Becky could? And it certainly uh, wasn't to suggest, as I think also these reports were, were intending, that he himself had changed uh, politics. You know, again, 
at the, you know, part of why I was asking you this question is because almost everything you just said about what Hani's plans were post Mandela's release and ascendancy uh, to to the, the to the leadership uh, was left out of these reports. I mean, you see the clip of him saying we're going to support Mandela, and that's it. The, the yeah, discussion of yeah. the alternative party, of the the yeah. semi you know return of weapons, the 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 you know all the other things you just mentioned are not part of that narrative. Uh, so when you see this footage of him in this suburb as they describe it, and all that that is meant to 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 be described with that term, uh, it it does I mean to, I take it as it meaning to suggest that again that he was not he was no longer in vogue that he was changing and. And this was just an unfortunate remnant of a past, blah 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 blah, <laughs> that no longer yeah. existed. So anyway, I, you know, there's a little, there's a little footnote. I, I want, I, I really, as full disclosure, I should say because you've had Andile on your show, um, and and I think that Andile and his the people in his movement are are the future of the new revolutionary um, uh, turn that we that I hope to make. Uh, sorry, that I hope, I hope, well, I hope to make with South Africa. But Andile, uh, when I was there, was uh, in the Black Consciousness movement, and was a very. We struggled side by side, and because he was an a, a undergrad student at the University of Witwatersrand, and I was a, a professor there, and uh, I, I think that Andile has a, a much more uh, pointed and 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 critique of Hani himself. Uh, than I have. I, I tend to cathedralize him a little bit because I, I've met him on several occasions and work with people near him. But, you know, let's not, I don't want to make him into an angel because going back all this way, he was part of the, uh, before I got there, he was also part of that um, juggernaut that uh, op- oppressed and had internecine violence against against other, other black groups. Mm-hmm. So um, he has a complicated history. But at the time, but in relation, so there's a complicated history in relation to the, the, the black consciousness people, and there's a there's a story that he, that he ran away from a from a a battle right. in Zimbabwe. Right, right. Uh, uh, and I and so I don't want to leave all that out, but I also want to say that that inside the ANC, he he and Winnie were were the, the biggest forces keeping us on the path that we should have been on. Well, again. And, 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 yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but again, I mean, uh, 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 forgive me for cutting you off there, but again, it reminds me of you know being this you know King's holiday that that it's the same thing. It is not to say that these people were not flawed, that they were perfect or anything like that. That was that's not my point, but it's to say that for me at least that uh, you know King wasn't assassinated because he cheated on Coretta or or some say cheated <laughs> on his PhD. I mean, that's not why he was assassinated. So. So whatever was wrong with Hani or whatever was wrong with with King or Malcolm or any of the other people we we you know praise it is not to say that that's what that's not what caused them to be a, a threat to those in power to a power structure that I happen to be uh, 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 in opposition to. So that's that's really my point in all this. But I'm glad you made that point and and, and please continue. I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I, I just I just heard uh, Andiri. In my in my inner ear, you know, my, my little <laughs> on my shoulder, saying, "You're always so kind to Hani. You're always so kind to Hani." You know, and and uh, and if I had been in black consciousness, I I would I would have a a critique of Hani, in ensconced within the critique of the of right. the ANC. Um, on the other hand, it has to be said that that Hani secured a mandate from the the, the lowest classes of of black people. And young black people, and that that was something that was really impossible for Mandela and others to do because uh, he cared, and because he did put his life on the line. Even you know, I, I let me tell you, there were situations with with guns and stuff which I'm not been allowed to talk about, but um, one of them I ran away from. Okay, so I'm just going to put that out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I entered this struggle an older man like 33 most people were in their 20s i, I had no uh, armed struggle training whatsoever and so i i know that i was scared all the time and um and i was actually asked to to move to another part of the the, the country to to start um uh, a new initiative and that part was kwazulu natal and i and i was just too afraid for my life i i i didn't i refused to do that uh because that was a Inkata stronghold, and it was 
the, the Zulu nation. And by that time, I was just too traumatized. And, I, and so I don't fault somebody for running away from a battle. You know, um, I've done it myself. Well, I've run away from a whole bunch of them that had nothing to do with real politics. So I mean, I'm, I'm no, I'm certainly not going to be a critic of that either. Um, but listen, we only have a few minutes left, and I did want to. I mean, there's so much more because you know, Brother Andile, you know, still owes me uh, uh, um, his critique of of my interview a few months ago of uh, of an author about uh, uh, Joe Slovo and Ruth First, and and. Uh, he was saying, you know, that this is why we need to be more critical of, of, of whites and, and these struggles. Um, and, and I, you know, I was too supportive of them uh, in particular because uh, of some of the history that they were involved in that doesn't get recounted. But particularly in, in Ruth's uh, willingness to engage the, the idea of armed struggle, which is something that was of, of uh, interest to me. And of course, the way she was you know, taken out uh, in violence yeah. in armed struggle. Um, yeah. So I'm still waiting for his critique. Uh, you know, he, he's he, he's going to give me a critique of that interview at some point. But one thing I did want to ask you very quickly, if we could just say a few words, is, is this issue of, of the assassination in 1966 of, of Vervoet, as I think you said how I, his name should be pronounced. Yeah, yeah. Um, and his killer, because I've, I've only come to learn about this a little bit, you know, just a little bit over the last few months. And I've been shocked at how little this this conversation seems to be included in the histories of uh, apartheid or, or the struggle in South Africa. Could you say a little bit about w- w- this killing and why you think it doesn't get the attention something of this nature should? I mean, Vervoet is the architect of the the official apartheid state, uh, and the fact that he was assassinated violently in 1966, it seems to me, should get more coverage, uh, uh, more discussion. Yeah. Uh, anyway, could you say, say a few words about that? Well, okay, the punchline at the end is that, I, the, one of the reasons why it doesn't get more coverage is because it, it, putting a political uh, interpretation on it means that you have to kind of marry the, 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 the typical, say, Marxist interpretation with uh, all other forms of, with different forms of, of different lenses, like psychoanalysis and interracial race theory, and it's... Uh, and it's it's it becomes it's messy and, and complicated, and so most people don't do it. Uh, the the killer was a, a guy who had a Greek father, and his mother uh, had had one white parent and one black parent, and his mother was was a, a so called colored or mixed race maid of this Greek father right, right, right. in Mozambique, and so this this uh, Dimitri spent a lot of time just just roaming the earth uh, from op- getting op jobs, and he never really got uh, proper papers. When he went to South Africa, he became a page in Parliament, and that's how he was able to gain access to uh, the clerk. But he, since he wasn't part of a political movement, and his the, the, the agency... I'm sorry, you didn't mean the clerk, right? You meant uh, he got access to, to, to Vervoet? Vervoet, yeah. Right. He, wait, thank you very much. He got, that's how in 1966 he got very close to Vervoet, because he could go into the parliament uh, in, the, in the pages uniform. And, he, and just uh, so people know, he, he stabbed him uh, repeatedly, I think, in the chest and neck with a knife, and that's how the, the assassination was carried out. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So the, the long and the short, short of it is that We've got a guy who, who there are many, as you've said before when we were off the air, there are many versions as to what he actually said about why he did it. And his lawyer has said that uh, I, the lawyer, determined that, that he was insane, and that was my the way I argued the defense, because he talked about a tapeworm. As you said, uh, Jared, maybe he did talk about a tapeworm, maybe he didn't. He wanted to marry, finally, we know leading up to that, he wanted to marry a woman who was classified as colored. Right, race. right. He then ha- went to reclassify. He, they wouldn't let him do that because of the, the, the Mixed Marriages Act. He went to reclassify himself as white and was, was rejected. So he couldn't marry the love of his life. Uh, leading up to that, he'd always been ostracized because he looked uh, dark. So he was always treated badly, even though he was classified as white. And so he began to... Uh, at one point, they say he thought of apartheid as being a bad system, 
because uh, it uh, marginalized poor whites. He was classified as white and poor. At another time, it is said that he thought of apartheid as a bad system because uh, it would not allow him to reclassify himself along his mother's line so that he could marry the love of his, of his life. What you need is a really complicated lens to look at all the different factors from the libidinal economy, the collective unconscious of, a, of apartheid and white supremacy, to a political economy, to, to, to think about the hydraulics, the pressures on the brain of a system like this. And the ANC never really had the uh, political tools to do that because on the left, there was never the, the freedom uh, to think about oppression through many different lenses. Uh, you had to think about it through the lens of the two-stage theory that came out of the Soviet Union. And on the right... Um, you know, the Mbeki people who were for mixed economy or capitalism, there wasn't much political thinking going on at all in terms of analysis. These are more or less policy wonks. So there's never been a, frame, a, a, a sanctioned framework to thinking about Dimitri. And, and if you claim him, uh, then you could be accused of, of claiming a mad killer as opposed to uh, thinking about his act politically. And I think that's why it's just easy mm-hmm. to let him drop through the cracks. Yeah. Anyway, I just I, yeah, I did want to just ask and raise that, uh, you know, because in particular, I found in, in one article where where uh, the black youth uh, uprising in the 76 Soweto uprising were calling him in, you know, were, were chanting his name and calling him into existence. Uh, the, the Demetrius, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the killer. Uh, uh, as a as a proud you know inspirational chant you know so it was like you know they they were at least politicizing his act uh, ten years per- earlier as something that was inspiring them uh, in, uh, at least according to this one article and I found that of interest and and, and thought that that was uh, um, it, at least itself even a, a, a statement as to why. Uh, so little is said or seems to be said about this act. I mean, you know, uh, um, even, in, in, you know, even if it was to, 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 to try to, to diminish him. Um, well, you're yeah. so right. You're so right. And, and this, is, this, is, this is the thing that the ANC has to manage. It has to manage black rage in general, and it has to manage uh, black youthful rage in particular. And so most, and this is, uh, am I still with you there? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Okay, I did. I did. And, and this is this is what all black leadership, you know, is about. Whether it's uh, Vernon Jordan or hmm. or, um, or or Obama, it's really about the management of what seems to be this kind of irrational anger that that um, the black community, uh, particularly the, sometimes particularly the youthful community, uh, that proliferates from them. And so, it Castro's couldn't understand you know, in that meeting, that this rage, which comes out as celebration of the bullets that will fly towards us, or as you're saying in 76, the the youth bringing back Dimitri to life. I mean, rather than saying, hey, what is that about? Let's think about that. Let's think about it productively. Not not let's think about that as something that we got to put a lid on so that these black people become proper political, communist political subjects. Let's think about that productively. I mean, what what is productive about this black rage that that seems to have no boundaries and can actually celebrate a so-called crazy killer, just like the black people celebrating uh, 9-11. You know, if you say, well, black people, like, you know, cheering in the ghetto for 9-11, it makes sense that the Arabs would do that. Mm. You know, one person said, but, but, but it's completely inappropriate. For a black American to do that, well, your your anger does not have to be connected to a comprehensive, conceptually coherent political agenda for right. it to be legitimate. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, I've, I've I've been amazed my entire adult life of how often people have said because I don't have a perfectly formulated answer to every problem that exists that my criti- criticisms of white supremacy or capitalism are misplaced you know it's like yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I, mean, yeah, I mean how much do i have to have figured out to know that these two systems are a mess exactly exactly <laughs> exactly exactly anyway. so we should be we should be following that rage and that and that celebration uh as opposed and and seeing you know what does it have to teach us 
mm. as opposed to saying, oh, this is improper. Mm. Well, Dr. Frank Wilderson, thank you very much again for joining us uh, here at I Mix What I Like. We greatly appreciate your time and your work, and we will uh, link to everything we can uh, so people can find you more easily. Uh, and, of course, we will be doing this again before too long. So thank okay. you again. Thanks, Jared.